electric subways, all of our transportation is oil fired, which is why transportation sector is essential and the big place that's going to take the hit as uh, oil availability declines. But it's bigger than just the transportation infrastructure, as huge as that is. Our cities have been designed around driving cars long distances. And I'll uh, show us some figures on just how much we do drive. So if you look at global energy sources, um, we get more of our energy from petroleum, from oil, than anything else. And natural gas is uh, second, and coal uh, are, are kind of neck and neck, and that's the three fossil fuels. Um, but I'm focusing on oil here for a reason, which if you look at our uh, energy reserves, whether you look at what's called proved reserves, where we know it's in the ground, we know where it is, we've got a pretty reliable estimate of how much is there, or we look at potential reserves, some very rough estimations of how much resources are in the ground across the world. Um, the answer percentage-wise is kind of the same. There's a lot of coal, there's a lot of potential in uranium, and there's a little bit of oil and a little bit of natural gas. So if you kind of compare and contrast what we're using, which is predominantly oil and natural gas, to what we have, which is predominantly coal and uranium, it becomes very obvious, uh, without a lot of calculation, that oil is what's going to falter first. Well, oil's a fossil fuel. They're not making it anymore. It's an inheritance. We're burning it. There's no way to recover that. You burned it. So how finite is this resource is kind of the uh, trillion dollar question. Well, this is a graph of our uh, rate of extracting oil uh, from the earth over the years. And it grew exponentially uh, at about 7% a year, doubling every 10 years for decades from the discovery of oil uh, until the 1973 uh, Arab oil embargo. And there was this tiny little drop here. And then we went right back to massive consuming until the uh, fall of the Shah of Iran. Iran immediately, uh, really overnight, stopped exporting <coughs> oil. Prices doubled again. There was a uh, drop off in global oil consumption. And then we. So we're trying to look at how long this kind of resource will last. This is the kind of analysis you typically see. Um, we have uh, approved reserves in the world of uh, 1,200 billion barrels, and we're consuming 31 billion barrels a year. So the oil will run out in 41, barrel, uh, 41 years. <coughs> Makes sense, right? It's simple division, but it's an utterly meaningless calculation. This is the graph of world oil consumption if that were to hold true, right? So we had this exponential growth, and then starting this year, just coincidentally, it would be exactly flat at a constant rate. And then 41 years later, there will be this horrible day when we will hear this gurgling sound in every oil well in the world as we suck air. Well, obviously, that's not how it's really going to happen. So how would it happen? Well, we have a great lesson here. There was this one country in the world that produced, discovered oil production as a commercial enterprise and produced most of the world's oil for uh, decades and decades thereafter, and in fact had more oil than any other country except Saudi Arabia, and that was the United States. Uh, Britain, uh, the British Navy is said to have floated to victory in World War I on a sea of American oil. American oil was also essential in the, uh, the Allied victory of World War II. Lots of history there we won't go into. But production of oil in the United States peaked. And it's a marvelous study of what that looks like. And more importantly, it was actually predicted. It wasn't just something that happened when we were shocked and surprised what we were. But this uh, oil geologist from uh, Shell Oil Company, M. King Hubbard, in 1956, went to an oil conference and presented a thing on oil depletion and said, that sometime between 1965 and 1970, U.S. oil production will peak and will decline forever thereafter. This was ridiculous. This would be like a former vice president saying that the, the whole planet is going to overheat if we don't change our ways. Um, well, oil production peaked in 1970. And suddenly it wasn't so ridiculous. I mean, he had scorn he'd done. This, this was damaging to his career until it came true. So how did he do that? Well, it 
That would be a worthwhile lesson. Uh, they didn't have uh, Excel back then. Um, 1956, yeah. Uh, so he used graph paper, and he graphed uh, global oil production um, historically uh, up to 1956 here. And he did an estimate of how much, or this was the proved reserves in the world, so he knew how much that was, and extending the graph, he figure out how long that would last, kind of that division we just did. And then he took a guess at how much more oil was in the country that we hadn't exactly found yet, but based on the size of uh, known fields and things, he could project that. And he made this interesting assumption. He made this bell-shaped curve. He had two different assumptions about how much oil there might be, a lower bound and an upper bound. And he drew these bell curves on consumption. He said, about the time we've exhausted half of the total resource, production will start to climb. Because an oil well isn't like a gas tank, where you stick a big straw in it, and you suck it down until you hit the bottom, and it runs dry. Oil wells are like water wells. So if you've had a country well, right, you know you can pump the water out of your well too fast, and it does suck air. But then more water trickles in later, and you're fine, right? There's a recovery rate. And oil wells behave that way as well. And uh, so individual oil wells, individual oil fields, follow a Hubbard curve, which is a bell-shaped curve of their production rate. And if you add up the output of all the wells or all the regions or all the countries, you still get this bell-shaped curve. So that was how he did it. And uh, this is what the result actually looked like. So um, looking at the 48 states, uh, oil production in the U.S. hit this peak. We're on this downward slope now. Um, that little knee there is the Alaskan pipeline. Changed everything, right? <laughs> Not really. Um, the other interesting thing he looked at was when oil fields were discovered. So most of the oil in the United States was discovered back in the 1930s. That's when we found the big fields in Texas and Oklahoma. And he found it was about 40 years from the discovery of fields to their peak production. And so applying those two uh, approaches, he fairly accurately uh, estimated the peak of U.S. oil production. Well, what did we do? I mean, we, we peaked, right? So that was horrors. Well, here's what we did. Um, here was our peak in production, and our consumption, you know, other than that, you know, price spike decline has continued growing, and uh, we just imported. So that's the 59% uh, of our oil that now comes from overseas, when in the 1940s we were a massive oil exporter and fueling most of the world. Um, what this also shows is a demand response to price spikes, right? So we had a small decline in demand after the 73 embargo, a large decline after the 79 uh, fall of Iran, and then we see actually another decline here as a result of the price spikes we've seen in the last few years. But it's a small decline. It's not a um, community solutions 90% kind of decline. Looking at the other thing that Hubbard did, oil discovery, uh, the largest fields in the world were discovered uh, back here in the 1960s. That's when we brought uh, Saudi Arabia's Gawar fields, a number of the other big Persian Gulf fields online, and we found more oil, but the green bars here are oil discovery, and you see they've been declining, and the purple bar here is extraction rates, and what you can see is for several decades now we have been sucking oil out of the earth faster than we've been finding new deposits. We are living off of the discoveries of past decades. And the discoveries we are finding are smaller and smaller, they're in more uh, difficult areas, they're in deeper amounts of water, deeper in the ground, um, in hostile environments. Uh, You've heard of the Canadian tar sands? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't have that in this presentation, but I, I have pictures of what that looks like. And it's like something out of an apocalyptic movie. It's horrendous. The largest uh, bulldozers and scoopers in the world scooping this black, slimy sand into giant buckets where they boil the uh, tar out of it, which they then refine into oil. And I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be doing this if there was any.